During the first half of this century, the west end of Bridgeport, Connecticut, was the home of one of the largest Hungarian communities in America. Worden Avenue ran through a bustling part of the neighborhood. Today, scarcely a trace of the old community remains. There are no historic landmarks to commemorate its passing, nothing to tell us of the immigrants who settled here. Kitarom reskatu karom, lani fudede, raya zaporkin tulato, fiui kenyame, smik siram elnem takar. Külföldön is leszek magyar, magyar, magyar. Külföldön is magyar. Nem. Nem mész el. Minden el van öntöntve. Jövő héten indulok. Soha többé nem látlak. Már öt éve, hogy Tinko itt hajta a családját. Nem vagyok Tinko. Ezt akarod barikával? A gyerekkel, amit hordasz magadban? Nem fogom a földes úr földjön hagyni. Ezt nem engedem meg. Figyeld meg, hogy nem kell körvegnünk tégyút. Ez az otthonom is itt maradó. Ígérem neked. Ígérem. Ígérem, hogy a maradék éveimet itt töltöm. A saját földöm. A gyerekeim.
medical inspector discovered she had the eye disease trachoma and her parents were forced to leave without her. Half a year later, she started out again, this time alone, and determined that nothing would stop her. Well, they put me on the ship, but <laughs> we walked, and they just pushed people around wherever they could. They pushed me into a cabin with some Russian girls, and they scared me because I was so small and they were so big, and, and they had big, long hair dripping with oil. I don't know. This was many, many years ago. This was 74 years ago. But I still remember that dripping oil. So I took one look and one turn, and I sneaked out between them out of the cabin. And I was walking, and the crew, the men on the ship, were busy placing people in their cabins. So I went over to a man who came with his family. I said to him, would you please give me room in your cabin so that I'll be one of the kids. He said, oh, my child, I got enough trouble with my own. Don't bother me. There is no room here. I went out and I saw a woman with two little children. I asked her, would she take me? Would she give me room in her place? She said, all right, come on in. Well, I was very grateful. And I had a place. Millions of others of all nationalities made the voyage. Mm -hmm. This is the blackest. Cálmese, amigo. Todo ha de salir bien, ya verá. Escuche, me leeré un checho de la Biblia. Y Jesús dijo, a todos vosotros, Many of the immigrants were traveling to join family members already across the Atlantic. The morning before we landed, everybody got up in the middle of the night and got dressed and got ready. Everybody was out on the deck watching and waiting for the sun to come up. That was the only celebration I know of. And we were all standing and take a glimpse of the Statue of Liberty. Then everybody, thank God, we're here. Then everybody went off the ship. Everybody who had somebody already waiting for them, so they let them go. They signed some papers and they let them go. But those who didn't have anybody waiting were put in cages. I was in a wired cage. <laughs> I, 
I didn't know what to do there. I had no luggage, I had nothing. And I just stood in that cage and waiting to see when I see a familiar face. And then I noticed my sister, my brother coming towards me. And that was a very happy reunion. I haven't seen my sister for six years, my brother for five years, and they took me home. A different kind of welcome awaited other Hungarians. So he said that was kind of a harrowing experience, you know, riding and riding. Mary Kutana's father never for forgot hours, the reception he received. At Ellis Island, he boarded a train for a coal mining town in Pennsylvania. And then he, then he got off the train, and he was um, walking. Um, they did have some, you know, direction, but um, he was dressed in his, you know, immigrant's clothes. And well, for the first several weeks that he was there, and um, the kids began to throw stones at him because he was dressed differently. You know, and he was quite shook up by that. In Bridgeport, the story was much the same. Children found the welcome especially rough. Lou Babakosh remembers how local kids taunted him and his mother when he was five years old. Oh, well, sure, what the hell. You figure that. You take the woman with those babushkas or what the hell they got on their head and, and uh, they start hollering, giddy, giddy, goo, shine my shoe, and and so on and so forth, and throw stones at you and everything else. Once Hungarian kids had lived in America a while, even they gave the new arrivals a hard time. There was a special name for the newcomers, as Jules Matush recalls. Well, at that, that time, it was any boy that came in the neighborhood. But the Greenhorns uh, actually were, uh, were uh, new arrivals from Hungary. And uh, any time... Uh, I remember I, I'd be walking on the street and all of a sudden I'd see a taxi going down the street. There was no other answer for that but a greenhorn, you know. And all of the kids would run down the street and when they'd be coming out with their tags, you know, and you'd greenhorn, greenhorn. <laughs> what were their tags? <laughs> well, it would give the destination. It was their immigration tags. Finally, the, fellow, the people that invited would come out and call us all kinds of, make, uh, <laughs> raise great doubts of our paternity. <laughs> We got this fellow, Tudish guy. He lives out in Cortland, Cortland Street, out in Black Rock. When he come over, he was a greenhorn, and his sister and his family. And you know, he used to do. <coughs> they used to call him everything. They want to fight him, but well, he'd fight anybody. But he had to get a stone, take his handkerchief, a big red hanky, take and put a stone in it, tie a knot on it. He'd say, "Come on," uh, in Hungarian. They, I wouldn't repeat it because, oh, and he wouldn't go down who it is. He'd take and uh, he'd clobber you. crawling with lice. Alu, Mishike, Alu. Eda Shapad Hamaroshan Iblasmar. Alu. A heart speed to the city streets. We begin to feel the fire. like tall buildings as the chemicals they take us higher the night's young and it's just begun as she puts her hand in mine we want to chase the night
the old community, there were no less than five Hungarian houses of worship. St. Stephen's Roman Catholic Church was right down the street from the Holy Trinity Greek Catholic Church. The Pine Street Hungarian Reformed Church was nearby. A couple of blocks north, the temple Ahavath Akim served a sizable Hungarian Jewish population. And close to the temple was the State Street Hungarian Reformed Church. Yeah, it would be an awful clamor when the church bells would go off at noon. Well, that used to be yeah. wonderful. You could tell the church Greek bells Catholic Church. You could, you, you could distinguish between the different bells after a while. The old churches have been torn down, but new Hungarian congregations carry on the old traditions. Hogy szolgáljon testünk egészségére és lelkünk örömére, a Szentfiat érdemei által, amen. St. Emery's Church in Fairfield still observes the custom of blessing the Easter food on Holy Saturday. Native peasant delicacies the early immigrants brought with them helped bridge the gap between old country and new. They get a piece of pork on a stick and they put it over the fire and get the grease on the bread and then they put a little onions cut up and little green peppers and some used to take cucumbers and put them on there and he said, believe me it was a it was a good meal they used to call it Shutney Solona the kohlrabi here which is a, a staple of the Hungarian kitchen it's a very hearty plant it's uh, used in soups for flavoring and it's also used as a side dish and it's very delectable it has a slight taste of cabbage to it it's not very common in the United States here Mostly foreign people use it. I don't know where I'll be. I'll be on the road to go to the city. I'll be on the road to go to the city. I'll be on the road to go to the city. I'll be on the road to go to the at the First United Church of Christ, stuffed cabbage, kolbas, and chicken paprikash are prepared for the annual Hungarian festival and dinner dance. At holiday time, the families all celebrated, but it overflowed, you know, from one family to another. Reiner Furniture Store used to give Hungarian music on Saturday nights with a bandstand outside and, you know, loudspeakers. Rocco C. Hall was a focal point of social activity. Family weddings were held there and uh, New Year's parties and all kinds of social events. It was, uh, it was a uh, hall built by a fraternal organization called the Rocco Society. Different church groups would throw would have plays, entertainments, dances. The Rockwell Society itself would have their own dances. 
And I think it was one of the biggest, if not the biggest, uh, uh, hall in, in Bridgeport. It was enormous. They had basketball games there. They had, they had uh, fights, wrestling, everything there. Every house had flowers all around it, and all the neighbors vied with each other to have the most beautiful flowers. They tried to recreate their flower gardens around their homes in Hungary. Saturday afternoons, they'd all get in the backyard on the tree and play pinochle and make a lot of noise about it. It was a good card game because each, each, each uh, family had about 200 gallons of wine down the cellar, so the gallons of wine would be coming up, and they'd all make wine. I remember uh, in the fall at the, the, at the grape pressing time, I'd open the cellar door and that the smell of that mush, they call it, you know, the brewing of wine would knock you right on your back, you know? <laughs> well, the hunkies were just the same as anybody else. They liked to fool around, too, don't forget that. And they did. So, like I'm saying, the, no, I wouldn't tell you too much about, about the, the tricks they used to play on somebody else. From the garbage playing into the taverns and so on and so forth. You'd be surprised what went on there. These photographs of children scavenging in the West End dump were taken during the Depression. This too was part of the life of the Hungarian neighborhood. Uh, next to St. Stephen's School was the city dump. And once the city dump would start to burn, it was very difficult to put out. The smoke would just rise and, you know, the air would literally become very acrid. And this used to go on for two, three days. Today you'd get a, you know, uh, pollution warning or something like that. We didn't, you lived with it. Hungarians came to Bridgeport to find jobs. 
what they found paid far less than the American working man would accept. Many immigrant women worked in sweatshops, and child labor was a common practice. Oh, you can lie your age them days. I seen some that come over Europe, the Benz or the Slovak, you want to call them. Uh, they were 10, 11 years old, and they said they were 16. Of course, them days you didn't have birth, you know, to show your birth certificate. Yeah, hell, they went in there and worked 15, 14, 12 years, 13 year old. The American Tube and Stamping Company was one of the early large industries where Hungarians found jobs. Its buildings still stand, and people still recall what the working conditions were like. Yeah, we had a what we called a forge, and we used to pass it on the way to the Seaside Park, and many of the kids' fathers, you know, worked in there. When you looked in, you couldn't recognize one man from another because they were uh, working in this, uh, you know, heavy... Uh, air with uh, soot, you know, all around them. Sometimes the children would have to go in and give messages, you know, to the father, and really all you could see were their eyes, that, you know, to distinguish them because they were uh, working in these open forges without any kind of safety, you know, precautions at all. I remember so many of these sturdy, strong, you know, young Hungarian men who died in their late 40s or 50s of silicosis as a result you know, of the, the work in these open forges. But of course when they were young, you know, they were strong and they could strip to the waist and work all day in unbelievable temperatures. In 1907, the American Tube and Stamping Company refused to raise its wages above a dollar and 35 cents a day. The workers responded with a strike. Over a thousand Hungarians walked the picket lines and soon riots broke out. Some Bridgeport papers condemned the immigrant workers as irresponsible and ignorant rabble who stole jobs from decent American men. One paper even complained they were unfit parents who permitted their children to die of neglect. Resentment toward the Hungarians was most deeply felt by the Irish, whose neighborhood bordered theirs and whose jobs were often threatened by the new arrivals. The tension between the two groups affected children and adults alike. Uh, we went to school on the other side of Railroad Avenue, not on this side where the Huntington was, and uh, we had to load our pockets up with those uh, big stones like this were in the road. It wasn't paved like it is today. And load up, we used to fight the Irish going under the bridge and the, on the other side of the railroad track. Oh, sure, it was a battle all the time. This was between the kids, not the, well, when the old man would go out there, why, sure, they'd have a bloody battle. The outbreak of World War I caused special problems for the Bridgeport Hungarians. Their homeland was now at war with the United States. The majority of Hungarians joined other immigrant groups in supporting and fighting for this country. But patriotism was no simple matter when the gun you fired could be aimed at a member of your own family. For the women of the community, there was an equally agonizing problem. There was a decision, you know, should, should you really go and work in a factory, in a munitions factory, for instance, of which we had a you know, big one in, in Bridgeport, uh, because they knew that they were working for a product that would could eventually wind up on their homeland. For my mother in particular, who uh, women were sought out, you know, to work, and she had that decision to make. She was one of many, you know, that uh, faced this problem and this ambivalence. The end of the war did not bring peace to the community. The treaty reduced Hungary's national boundaries by over 50%. Many of the immigrants found their homes and families in Hungary now part of the newly created country of Czechoslovakia. Their dream of returning to live in Hungary was over. As the war was ending, a different battle began in the west end of Bridgeport. One of the worst influenza epidemics of modern times swept this country, and a cramped tenement community became a deadly place to live. 
And it were people who were lying on the sidewalks. They brought out mattresses and they were lying on the side. It was a October, the late October and November, and it was a very warm period, very humid and dull. And, and all you could hear every night, the singing of the wake, people dying, and the singing that what was, it was terrible. My mother died one night, and uh, at that time, the custom was to, to lay out the people in the, uh, in the home. And so we went over to a, uh, a cousin's house to sleep, and she woke us up next morning with the news that uh, my uncle had died. The next, next day, yeah. Great big strap man, about 35 years old. It seemed the stronger they were, the faster they went. And it got so bad the, that the undertakers ran out of caskets. And the doctors who came would be half loaded because uh, they, 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 they figured in their own mind that if they were drunk, they wouldn't get it, you know. And they, they'd come swear, rolling into the house to see these patients, you know. But once that uh, flu hit them, it was only a matter of a day or so, and they were dead. You know? They were lucid and everything. I remember uh, when I was, I was only about seven years old, and my mother knew she was about to die, and she was very lucid, and she just kept telling the women how, to, how she wants to be prepared for a funeral, you know. Would, would neighbors and friends... Uh, oh, they'd all come in, yeah, sure. They'd ask her what her favorite uh, food was, and they'd cook it for her, you know. But it was ho horrible down there. A few hundred yards off the tip of the West End was Fairweather Island. Here the Hungarians found a place to escape from their crowded tenement existence. And here they met with other newly arrived immigrant groups. Oh yeah, we were out there. We had our clams already picked and we had our blackfish caught. Let's go up and, oh man, Kereke said, let's go up and shoot me some solo. All right, we went up. Some Italian people were on the island that time. And Oh, he says, what the hell are you guys doing? And he says, we're roasting turkey. Because that was a nickname for a tur turkey, but it was Solana. And uh, we were eating it, it was putting it warm, and Jesus was right out of this world. And so this Italian fellow I come over there, I'll never forget him. I heard the guy call him Angelo. Whatever the hell he said to him. I said, look, I'm going to give you a piece of this. You don't like it, don't spit it out in front of me because I'll stand up and I'll knock you down. So, you see me eating it, he ate it. He asked me what kind of pork that was. I told him what we call it, Solona. And, uh, watch what the way we cut it and everything else. Would you believe we were out there about four months later and all these Italians were out there doing what the hunkies were doing, shooting these solos Of course, when we were out on the island, uh, where we were, in the morning we'd get up maybe an hour or so earlier. Then we'd go out the way we were and dive in the water naked. To a bloomer one day, he... He caught us, and he was a cop out the island. So next time, put clothes on. Put a pair of trunks on, anyway, he said. Well, we just crawl out of bed, you know. And we never used pajamas out the island. They used to sleep naked and then go in the water naked in the morning. Anybody was peeking, it was their own fault, that's all. No, it was a good life, very good life.
Russ Ghetto. Well, he's a Hungarian boy from the south end. Went to high school with me. Uh, we played on the same soccer team, intramural soccer. And I think he died one or two years ago. This area was called Hungarian Palm Beach at the time that when Fairwell Island was an island. The only ones who used this uh, island were people who would come over in boats. And uh, the only one who would come over would be the Black Rockers and the Pal Pals from down, Hungarian people from down in the West End. They'd row out here and they'd row around to St. Mary's there and there was a, uh, coming out of the rock wall, there was a uh, spring and he'd bring five gallon uh, bottles out and fill them with spring water. But all they had was those uh, uh, rowboats. There were no hotboard motors in those days. And they, uh, there was, they'd have two man crews, two wars apiece, and row that way. And on this side was the mud flats. And somewhere we got out of school, our, uh, well, they took away our shoes and cut our hair off, sent us out to pasture <laughs> out in the mud flats. And it was a beautiful level spot. But uh, they had to have some place to have a dump, so they uh, they made a mountain over here out of how this refuse. But this is a beautiful, beautiful spot when I was a child. By the 1920s and 30s, those able to save enough money began moving away from the tenements of the West End. Soon a new Hungarian settlement grew in Villa Park, a rural area in nearby Fairfield. Stores prospered, churches were built, and the Hungarians lived in friendship with recent immigrants of other nationalities. For some, this move to the suburbs was the fulfillment of the great American dream. But in Bridgeport, those who stayed behind continued to derive support from the old tenement community. If a birth occurred, you know, by word of mouth, everyone found out about it. The birth occurred at home, of course, and the mother never had to worry about who would take care of her children or, you know, how the family would be fed because the, the, there was just kind of an, an automatic activity that took place. One woman would tell another, and... Um, there was food delivered to the family, the children were taken care of, uh, you know, the laundry was taken care of, and it was never any kind of a worry for a woman if she was, um, uh, had a new baby, you know, who would be taking on the extra chores. It was just one of these things that, that happened in a close-knit neighborhood. Many times I remember accompanying my mother to someone who was sick and she would be taking soup, bread, you know, whatever and helping to bathe, you know, the person, or just sitting up, you know, some nights. This was never a problem, because by word of mouth, uh, you would find out, you know, who needed help. I certainly remember as a child, um, the wakes that were held at home, and the house was marked then with a floral piece on the door. The men and women both went to help rearrange the furniture, you know, to make room for the coffin in the living room. And once again, you know, the children were taken care of. Food galore would be taken to the house. And this, this was a, a, a kind of a natural response to something that occurred in the neighborhood that needed a nice human, you know, response to it. There was never an organization, you know, or a leader. These things happened. And they happened very naturally and very lovingly. Burn it in. Mishka, you and Tommy can make your cylinder now. Yeah. 
ogni cara gondosa. Miért lehet meghalni, amelőtt megvettem ezt a földet? Jövő tavasszal egy házat építek. Mennyivel boldogabb lett volna. Tudod, sosem akart, hogy eljöjjön Amerikába. Sosem akart, hogy nem vagyok. Eljött. Egészet neki csináltam. In the 1950s, the Connecticut Turnpike was built through the heart of the old Hungarian community. During the 1960s, a redevelopment program demolished the remaining houses and stores to make way for a modern industrial park. Today, the remaining original immigrants and their descendants are scattered throughout the Bridgeport area. community no longer exists, but its spirit lives on. Today's festivals, like the celebrations of half a century ago, help to keep alive the memory of the life they left behind.
we were in the neighborhood and the neighborhood was in a sense you know our neighborhood and we weren't that mobile we were there you know every day and you experienced what the other fellow experienced really I don't think it was you know um, uniquely or distinctively Hungarian I think all all immigrant groups had the same kind of experiences we had it rough but I think we still had a wonderful life Thank <laughs> you. 